Thank you, Benson. Uh, appreciate everybody taking time out of their schedules. Uh, I know uh, most of the organizations we work with, things have been uh, hectic to say the least. Um, what we thought might be helpful um, as a firm is to provide a set of uh, educational resources um, for uh, our clients and the industry as a whole. And so we've been doing a webinar series on um, various operational and strategic uh, considerations that folks uh, need to uh, focus on during the pandemic. This is part of that series. Uh, in this case, we're, we wanted to uh, provide some perspectives uh, from our affiliation practice um, on what we think some of the implications might be for partnering uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, and so with that, what I'd like to do is, is orient us around when folks are thinking about strategic options or partnering, we like to orient them around, uh, this is not about getting a deal done, uh, checking a box. This is about trying to identify the best strategy to achieve the organization's mission and vision. Um, at a time of disruption, uh, like we're experiencing now, where some significant adverse impacts on healthcare organizations, uh, sustaining one's mission is really front and center and making sure that you're responding to community needs. So that's really where we, we uh, come from. Um, creating that sustainable path is, is really uh, the essential challenge we face uh, via whatever option uh, a board and an organization ultimately pursue. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to walk folks through um, some of the, the economic and, and other uh, consequences we're seeing as a result of the pandemic. This is um, a, a chart that actually shows uh, the impact on the restaurant industry. Uh, this is open table reservations. And you can see that literally that market vanished overnight. Uh, and is starting to bounce back a little bit in some states as they start to relax the stay-at-home uh, orders that have been fairly prevalent throughout the country. Um, but this gives you an idea of the order of magnitude uh, of the disruption we're seeing. Obviously, healthcare has not seen the same extent, but we'll see in a minute it's been very material. Um, we think a little bit globally about the economy and what the economy is going through. Um, this is also il illustrative, um, this chart. The red line straight down, almost straight down, is the 2020 impact of the stay-at-home orders and the impact of the pandemic. Uh, the other lines there reflect the other recessions in the United States post-World War II, and it basically is how many months it took the economy to recover the jobs that were lost. And you can see that the, the great recession that we all went through in, in 2007, 8, 9, and onward took a very long time relative to the post-war experience. And obviously, the amount of time it's going to take to recover employment is going to be largely dependent upon how quick the rebound is. Just as this is unprecedented, you can see that red line, the rebound might be unprecedented in terms of its steepness. Um, but for purposes of comparison, I put on two dotted lines there that you'll see. Uh, the first one um, is uh, one that mimics the slope of the 1948 recession and its rebound. Uh, and you can see there that in that case, we're looking at 16 months to regain the employment that has been lost just in the last couple months. If you look at the other line, the one that has a more gradual slope, that mimics the 2007 Great Recession. And that Ballpark is about 110 months, um, which by my recollection is about nine years to recover employment. Now, I'm not an economist, but clearly what we've gone through is going to have a significant impact on employment. And just to remind folks, we're not insulated from that in healthcare. Obviously, there's been a lot of furloughs. A lot of our friends and colleagues have, have experienced that. But also, as organizations, we see the downstream effect of that with folks either losing their insurance or having insurance that has higher deductibles, et cetera. So we would expect the self-pay, bad debt exposure. Uh, if, if the unemployment uh, effects don't rebound really rapidly uh, and the, the Fed chair was warning about um, a more prolonged recession yesterday, those effects on organizations will be material. So they're likely to be a second wave, not of COVID, although that's, that's certainly a risk, but of economic and fiscal consequences for healthcare organizations. Um, this slide really does a nice job of really illustrating 
um, uh, the data points that, sh that reveal just how significant the impact on volume has been uh, in the provider sector. And you can see it varies significantly by um, uh, specialty, but many of these specialties are the profit margin, the bottom line for uh, healthcare organizations. So extremely disruptive, uh, even beyond the volume uh, decreases. Um, what we're seeing in our conversations with clients is month of April was a 40, 50% uh, uh, variance from budgeted revenue for that month. And, and March was about half that. So uh, it will be interesting to see as folks go back to being able to schedule and do elective procedures, how rapidly um, volume and revenue bounce back. Um, a large part of that is going to be dependent upon our ability to test and trace uh, and to the degree the behaviors of the virus uh, as to whether we have a second wave or isolated spikes or, or what have you. Um, I, what I'd note here is that um, this chart shows clearly there's been a nice uptick uh, in testing capacity going back to early March. Arguably, it's it's somewhere between one half and one third. I believe what experts are saying we'd need uh, nationally. Um, real positive trend is the red line, which is the rate of positive tests. Um, so what you do want to see is a testing increasing, uh, and you want to see the rate of positives decreasing. And so that is um, certainly a positive uh, trend that's that's worth. Uh, tracking. There's nuances, and this is obviously national data, and there's a lot of uh, different regional and local effects that, that need to be monitored closely. So the, the takeaway from uh, the pandemic and its effects is, you know, you put this in some context. Well, in 2008 and 9 in the Great Recession, what were some of the impacts that we experienced? Uh, and you can see there was a hit on revenue, uh, a change in payer mix, bad debt, resulting in, in weaker financial performance. The one thing that hasn't been mentioned to date associated with 2020 has been um, the weakness of the banking system in 2008, 2009, with the amount of leverage, underwriting of mortgages, et cetera. The banking system is viewed as being in a much better position at this point in time. Um, on the on the um, flip side of that, however, is we don't know what the ongoing disruptions to business will be, either in localized areas if they have a spike or if there is a second wave of, of uh, the, the surge or as a result of the pandemic in the fall and winter. So a lot of unknowns there, and we do have significant um, COVID-related costs that need to be incurred. So um, certainly of, of a magnitude that is similar, uh, perhaps greater than what was experienced uh, in 28, 29, as it relates to healthcare. I think there's no, no precedent for what we've seen in the very short term. And the, and the general economy. Uh, and we're not isolated from that. And you can see from what Moody's and S&P are saying, um, start of the year, they had a positive outlook for the not-for-profit healthcare sector. Um, they've, as a result of the pandemic, have switched those two outlooks to negative impacts on, ca adverse impacts on cash flow, um, adverse impacts on profitable procedures, adverse impacts on payer mix. Um, Moody's, is saying majority of hospitals will stand this temporary disruption. Uh, I think that's right, um, but clearly a majority of hospitals isn't very reassuring. If we have uh, 4,000 hospitals in the country plus, uh, we'd obviously want the vast majority of them to sustain um, and be able to sustain themselves through this. So um, something to keep keep in mind as we go forward. S&P with a similar um, outlook, emphasizing the impact on uh, operating costs and really saying the the impact will be specific to the duration, location, and severity um, uh, of of the pandemic. So clearly, a whole set of risks that uh, as of early February, uh, even perhaps early March, the vast majority of us did not appreciate uh, the magnitude of these. We've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years talking to organizations and boards about evaluating and mitigating strategic risk. One of the key responsibilities of boards going forward, and we think about this in terms of uh, vectors of risk, operating financial value and, and market. And here we've given some examples of some of the metrics that organizations uh, can use to look at risk. Um, and what's been interesting in thinking about the pandemic is 
you know, there was immediately an impact on on volume that obviously impacted revenue. Um, as volume fell, uh, staffing ratios became uh, out of whack with with different points in the hospital, and depending upon how impacted the organization was with pandemic patients, an impact on cash flow, and then you see uh, obviously ongoing impacts on payer mix again as that elective set of uh, uh, procedures and and payment associated with it has really dr dried up um, significant adverse effects there and ultimately resulting in severe impacts on operating margin as well as as cash flow so um, really an operating and financial perfect storm if you will um, uh, for many organizations S stepping back then um, what we thought might be helpful would be to get some perspective from each of you as to what you have seen uh, firsthand from the pandemic. And so we've got four categories to describe the impact of the pandemic on your organization. Dire, meaning that um, your balance sheet's depleted, cash flows are inadequate to fund your needs, and you don't have a sustainable path forward. Things look pretty pretty tough. Uh, that would be dire. Major, um, you've had major financial and operational impacts. Path to sustainability is in question. Um, and it really is dependent upon the post-surge environment and your execution of performance improvement plans and perhaps additional uh, federal uh, support. Significant uh, experience, significant business disruptions with uh, significant impacts financially and operationally, but you have a plan, you're executing the, the plan, and you have a defined and sustainable path forward. Some of that sustainability um, and that path forward might be the result of having a more robust balance sheet uh, and liquidity to start out with. Uh, a minor would be, you know, frankly, we have not seen a significant impact and the federal uh, support we've been receiving has been sufficient to mitigate the effects. Um, so we, we clearly have a sustainable path forward and will have, have minimal impact on us. Um, great, the results. So uh, nobody is indicating dire, um, but a quarter of folks are saying quarter of folks are saying major, and three quarters are saying significant. Um, so nobody saying minor as well. Um, so thank you for that. That's always helpful to get folks um, perspective. Um, so wanted to share with you a. Uh, a case study that I think illustrates some of the points we're trying to get across today um, and partnering during a pandemic. And some of these challenges uh, and opportunities are true generically of partnering, but I think the pandemic has really sharpened uh, the the consequences of them. Um, first is, I, I love this Peter Drucker quote, um, there's no perfect strategic decision. One always has to pay a price. One always has to balance conflicting objectives, conflicting opinions, and conflicting priorities. The best strategic decision is only an approximation and a risk. And I think um, that echoes very nicely with something we said at Stroudwater for uh, a decade, decade plus, plus, which is there are no risk-free options for healthcare organizations given the challenges that we face, whether it's a standalone ex uh, uh, a strategy that, that relies upon execution, or if it's a partnering strategy that's relying upon um, a partner to help uh, enhance the, the positioning of an organization, that introduces partner risk, and each has its own, own risk profile. Um, this is a case study of an actual client of ours, um, I mean, two clients of ours, two, uh, Hospital A and Hospital B. Hospital A, small rural hospital, operating losses, uh, weak uh, cash flow is liquidity challenge. Balance sheet has some stresses. Um, actually was able to find a partner um, that was willing to view them as an accretive acquisition based upon fundamentals, turnaround value, um, and their appreciation for um, some of the underlying um, um, foundational elements of this critical access hospital. Targeted investment um, to help preserve the value and enhance it. Um, and likelihood of a turnaround and operational improvement is seen as highly probable. Um, they viewed this prospective partner, this client, as um, a, a manageable set of risks and something they were willing to, to invest in. Uh, separate instance, um, another small rural hospital, also critical access, history of operating difficulties, weak balance sheet. Um, the the uh, 
most interested partner in this instance viewed them as as dilutive but having strategic defensive value that is they didn't want this hospital to fall in a competitor's hand um, operational improvement opportunities were perceived as limited um, the primary strategy was to streamline and reduce services to a bare minimum um, and essentially keep it out of somebody else's hand and they were actually intrigued by the idea of a bankruptcy filing to reduce trade payables and saw that as being likely necessary to make the whole transaction work um, so similar organizations with with really um, two different perspectives and the the catch here is that um, basically it was one hospital a and b were the same hospital the difference was in how they were perceived by this prospective partner so partner a um, was an experienced not-for-profit operator with multiple affiliates including rural and critical access hospitals they understood and valued their rural affiliates uh, and they appreciated some of the fundamentals that would would create value within the system the critical access hospital overhead cost allocation cost-based payment as a general stabilizing force uh, 340B um, status in terms of a pharmaceutical drug payment and rural health clinics uh, as a opportunity for them as a system as a whole. Um, they were familiar with similar turnaround situations and confident in their ability to execute and they saw the smaller affiliates not as uh, a nuisance or a distraction but as important strategic assets. The other prospective partner um, was a highly profitable, uh, well-regarded single hospital system, but they were not interested in, in understanding the financial and economic value um, that could be brought to the system from the critical access affiliate in this case. Uh, and in fact, we spent a good deal of time uh, outreach to this partner, uh, really trying to educate them and explain where some of these uh, uh, value propositions existed and actually offering to quantify them uh, on their behalf. These folks were unfamiliar, unfamiliar with smaller, smaller and rural hospital operations. They, they really did not understand rural health clinics or critical access hospitals. And they really just viewed the prospective hospital as a potential bunny pit. So it was really one transaction. In this case, we had two very different prospective partners and really two different value propositions. And as I mentioned earlier, we talked about um, how, uh, uh, there's no risk-free option, whether it's an independent strategy which has operating risk or an alignment or partnering strategy which has partner risk, uh, you, you need to manage those risks. And so this slide describes how to do that. In this case, what became very clear after this dialogue with the prospective partners was there was one partner that was really strategically aligned and understood the value proposition. And there was really value um, um, earned by our client on behalf of seeing that juxtaposition. They had actually, at the outset of the process, preferred partner B, just based upon past working history and relationship and perceptions. But it became very obvious as a result of the process that partner A understood their value and was willing to stand by them and make investments and appreciated what they were and what they brought to the system as a whole. So it changed their thinking. And it's just a way of saying it can be the exact same organization, but two prospective partners can view it entirely differently. And so this is why when we talk about minimizing and managing and mitigating risk, um, an affiliation process can, can be really critical to doing that. Um, polling question two. Um, what we'd like to understand here is from your perspective uh, and experience, can, do you feel that you can explain and quantify your value proposition to prospective partners if you were to engage in an affiliation process? And the answers are no, you know, we don't understand it and we don't have the ability to quantify it. Um, somewhat, um, we understand our value, but we've not quantified it and we don't have all the details and nuances, or yes, we understand our value and we can readily share it. Uh, and obviously there's a, a don't know component to this. What I will share with you while we're waiting on folks to answer is, um, you may recall there was one of the partners I was talking about in that case study that got it. They understood the value proposition. When they were presenting to our client's board, we asked them, um, can you share with us um, any analysis you've done on aspects of the value that you see 
uh, our client bringing to the system. And they they went through um, not a, a, a long, long laundry list, but it was obvious they understood the intricacies and the technical um, um, work that they needed to know to extract value and realize value as a system. One of them being the critical access hospital overhead cost allocation, which they they said we 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 expect that that's going to be worth uh, two million uh, dollars uh, annually. Uh, so we look at the polling results. Uh, quarter uh, say no, we don't understand, we can't quantify it. Half say we understand it, but we've not quantified it. And uh, a quarter say we we actually do understand it, and we do. Um, uh, have the ability to do that. So again, um, good split. Thank you for sharing that. So let's talk a little bit about some of the takeaways. Given that case study, given what we, we see going on in the industry uh, and our experience working with clients nationally, um, the first rule of thumb here is time is never a neutral factor. Uh, either there's operational results in your organization that are going to impact how you're perceived and that could be positive it could be negative or there's other things going on in the industry or the economy uh, in this case perfect example uh, again we had a we have a number of clients that are in process with affiliations nobody would have anticipated this kind of disruption uh, but this this type of disruption and variables like this tend to creep up the longer things get drawn out so um, Timing is important and keeping things on track uh, is is important as well. Um, there's always external variables. Um, when you think about partnering, you know we prefer to think of an affiliation or partnering as one strategic option in front of an organization. Um, there's always the option of remaining independent if there's a viable path forward. You evaluate the risk profile of that. You look at uh, potentially uh, partnering options, look at whether those are meeting your objectives. But the organization at the start of that needs to define its needs and constraints, define a set of objectives that are going to it's going to use to evaluate its options and track progress on those, frankly. And um, the third option available to you is, again, improving or enhancing operating performance and really describing and, and articulating that value proposition to partners. Those items together really enhance uh, and define your strategic options. Um, so that's how we, we think of this uh, coming together. Uh, and again, partnering from our perspective is one option um, that organizations um, should evaluate, but it's not the only option by a long stretch. Um, as we think about partnering, um, some of the items to think about as you you evaluate this. Um, first of all, a, a preferred option in this case, if it was partnering, should have uh, a way of of enhancing or enabling you to uh, actually implement and execute on your vision uh, for the future. Um, there should be a, a clear set of uh, goals and objectives for the organization, thorough understanding of of the different. Um, implications of each strategic option under consideration, partnering versus standalone versus perhaps a restructuring uh, or in some ex some events, a, a bankruptcy. Um, the nature and extent of the strategic and operating risks facing the organization will also inform um, this decision uh, as to what option is preferable. Um, when you're thinking about a preferred strategic option, again, what are your needs and um, how does that impact the community? What are the constraints and challenges we face? What are some of the opportunities? And again, uh, let's look at the risk profile of those options. Um, as we think about moving through or evaluating uh, affiliation or partnership um, as one of your, your options, uh, it really um, is, is an opportunity to develop a set of strategic objectives. And the beauty of strategic objectives is part of a partnering process. It's an opportunity to share a set of goals that reflects the perspectives uh, and, and really desires um, um, of your key stakeholders, board, physician, staff, and the community. It's a community tool for, for sharing with uh, stakeholders what it is you hope to achieve it provides a basis for evaluating options and evaluating proposals from partners. It provides the basis for an ask from partners. Um, this is what's guiding us in this process, and this is what we need from you 
prospective partner A, B, and C. Um, it also helps outline for um, purposes of regulatory review that the board has done a reasonable and prudent and diligent uh, set of process and steps um, in selecting a partner. So when you get to the regulatory review part of the process, having a well-articulated set of objectives and following a process and documenting it can be really important. Um, and it also helps keep you on track. So as we think about the implications of the pandemic on partnering, clearly we have a high degree of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen over the next 12, 24 months, and, and frankly longer. We don't know if there's going to be a second surge, a second wave of infection. We don't know if there's going to be just a series of smaller localized or regional uh, outbreaks or spikes. Um, and we don't know if the uh, government's reaction uh, to the behavior of the virus will result in continued disruption um, from COVID-19 and or a prolonged recession. I think we're clearly already in a recession, but a prolonged or deep recession is somewhat uh, in question now. Uh, certainly it's more likely than it was two months ago. Um, what does adaptation to a new normal uh, look like? Is, is there such a thing uh, going forward with minor disruptions. Some variation on those outcomes uh, seems likely, but we don't know which one. So we're making decisions with a high degree of uncertainty. Here are a couple of hypotheses, though, that we think are important uh, as, as you think about partnering and positioning your organization. Uh, first, there will likely be a lot more interest in partnering from hospitals and health systems that have been weakened by disruptions from the pandemic. Um, we anticipate that there'll be a lot of organizations that will need to drastically uh, relook at their operations to develop a sustainable path forward. And one path that will be considered will be partnering. Uh, clearly, operational improvement will be another. And there may be uh, options, including um, uh, bankruptcy or other uh, restructuring uh, approaches. Another hypothesis that prospective partners will be distracted and resource constrained, and likely to pursue partnerships that, uh, that sorry, this I should say, that do offer um, strategic value. So um, these organizations are gonna be perhaps more selective because their own resources are constrained. Um, so the question from this is, how does your organization differentiate itself in this environment if you want to, um, evaluate partnering as an option towards sustainability. How do you you separate yourself from the herd when there may be fewer organizations that are generically interested in taking on new affiliates? The first thing you need to understand is what is your glide path? Um, and a key tool for doing that is a 26 week uh, weekly cash flow projection. Um, and this can be broken in quarters 13 and 26, uh, Q1, Q2, um, but it allows you to make better decision making as an organization uh, in the short and medium term. Stress testing that projection, uh, and frankly, any prospective partner at an appropriate point in the process is gonna wanna have good optics into your trajectory. Um, so it's really important that an organization have some version of this uh, available to them so they're making good decisions and if they are engaged in a partnering process they can speak to the trajectory they're on and quantify that and then there's a number of key variables that that clearly go into this and need to be accounted for the impact on volumes um, increased expenses as a result as a result of covid19 ppe specialized staffing um, the CARES Act provisions in relief, et cetera, potential for increased bad debt. Um, and, and these all together will inform and help you develop what that trajectory is and a response plan to if there is a gap between your trajectory and what the sustainable path is going forward, um, addressing that. So our tool, and you can see here, there's a link to this tool on our website. Um, you can click on that link, it'll take you right to it, um, provides the organization with you know, what that glide path looks like and um, what, what that um, uh, cash flow position, uh, in fact, um, will be over those three to six months. 
Uh, in this case, you can see they started off with a, a uh, beginning cash balance of 2.5 million, and then it factored in the following um, provisions. Um, and you can see um, uh, later in the in the document, we've got a, a good summary and a good resource for folks that are looking at, let's try to quantify those various CARES Act provisions and how they might, might impact uh, our organization uh, going forward. The key point here, if you've decided to embark on a partnering process or, or thinking about it, is you need to have a credible path to sustainability. It doesn't mean you have to be at the end point, but it does mean you've needed to define what your plan is and you're executing on that plan and seeing results. Um, most partners are still challenged by figuring out what their own response to the pandemic is gonna be and how they get back to sustainability. But if you haven't done this work and you don't have compelling strategic value uh, and partners are trying to solve their own problems first, then they're likely to take a pass because they don't have the time or bandwidth to solve your problems for you. Uh, the flip side of that is if you've got a plan, you're working the plan, you're seeing results, and you're able to translate the value of your organization into the system and say, these are the things we can bring to you. This is this is how we would actually be accretive to the system. That's a very different conversation. So demonstrating that you have a credible plan for sustainability will alleviate concerns about management and the final financial resource drain from the prospective partner. Again, it's a completely different conversation. Some of that is dependent upon the perspective of the partner, but the best, the only thing you can control is your story and your the quality of your plan and your ability to execute on it. And so those are the things you can control. Not every prospective partner is going to get it uh, or respond to it, but it's absolutely necessary to get the kind of response you're going to want to have. So just briefly, as, as a, an advisor, one of the things we like to do for our clients is take their financial and operating results and put it in a strategic context. And in this case, we're looking at six years of operating cash flow, operating EBITDA. Those are the vertical gray bars. And you can see we fitted a dotted trend line to that. So this organization's actually had a nice uh, run with the exception of a dip in 2014. Um, it's a it's a pretty good outcome uh, through 2018. Um, what we've done is put that in the context of what are their cash flow needs as an organization. Um, and the red threshold there, we call that the survive threshold. That's the cash flow necessary to meet operating expenses and pay debt service. Uh, so if you can't do that, you're after a number of years, you'll burn through your reserves and eventually uh, be insolvent and, and bankrupt. The threshold above that is what we call sustain. This is um, the cash flow debt service plus 120% of depreciation. This is a level of investment that's necessary to renew your asset base, pay debt service, uh, and meet operating expenses. And for most organizations, this is adequate over any given time period, barring an exceptional once in a generation capital investment or some major demographic change, high growth, or some major competitive threat. Somebody's building an ambulatory site or picking off your physicians and requires you to do something. Uh, arguably, the cost of uh, IT uh, is something that triggers this, although um, uh, it, it, th those are not once in a generation investments, um, clearly. But that this is the level of threshold that most, or, most organizations need to be sustainable. And what you can see here is from 2013 to 2017, there was a cumulative deficit that built up. Uh, this organization, based on operating results, was, was running um, uh, cash flow insufficient to make investments. Uh, now, in their case, they had a very strong balance sheet, a very strong set of investments that were generating uh, non-operating cash flow, and they were able to substantially fill in, not completely replace, but fill in the shortfall. Um, but clearly, it's not where they'd ideally like to be positioned long term. And you can see, beginning in 2018, they were getting to that, that threshold. Um, but again, it's conversations like this within the management group, within the board, that are important for understanding how far are we from sustainability, what the risk this has created. The last threshold there is what we call Thrive, and that's cash flow plus 120% of depreciation uh, plus 4% operating expense. So that's a robust uh, top line revenue uh, operating margin, and that certainly gives folks the reserves that they can accrete over time to do major 
uh, uh, capital investment without incurring significant uh, additional debt. Um, but that gives you some strategic context there. So thinking about your value proposition to partners. Um, we talked about knowing your value uh, and being able to articulate your value, but this will um, be, be a critical conversation. Your strategic value outside of those fundamental things, cost overhead allocations and, and uh, 340B, covered lives, uh, referrals, all very important. Your strategic value may differ from partner to partner based upon uh, how you fit geographically, how you fit within certain referral patterns, uh, what their strategy is as an organization. Uh, so this is when we talk about strategic alignment between organizations, this is what we're talking about. Um, the critical thing for you is to be able to, to quantify what your value proposition is, either a strategic value. We have a client uh, in the Northeast that um, is a two hospital system, and you can see a quote down below. Um, we were talking to prospective partners, a lot of interest in these folks. They were outside of a metro area, but occupied a, a key geography and a key set of, of covered lives uh, for multiple uh, prospective system partners. And one of those partners articulated their value proposition by saying, we have to have a million lives to sustain and secure our clinical enterprise and mission as an integrated delivery system. And our partner was a key part, a building block of getting them to that threshold and north of that threshold. So they really valued the covered lives. Um, that's really, really important. Articulating your value to a system, designation, clinic designation, hospital designation related uh, opportunities that create opportunities for overhead allocation, 340B payments, rural health clinic enhanced payments, the value of referrals, the value of covered attributable lives, strategic and defensive value, um, all incredibly uh, important. The ability to spread overhead over a larger um, uh, base, also a consideration. Uh, whether your cash flow run is accretive. Even if it's not accretive, if you think about it this way, if you have a set of aligned uh, providers, primary care providers, and you as a health system with your aligned primary care providers is modestly cash flow positive. Um, my guess is there aren't a lot of other primary care clinics within the system that can claim to be cash flow positive on a standalone basis. So if you're sustainable as your own little ecosystem within this larger ecosystem, but you're, you're sustaining a primary care base that otherwise would go away, um, that has value. It has mission value, but it also has covered life and attributed lives value. Um, thinking about your balance sheet, again, we've had clients that have had maybe more modest cash flows, but very robust uh, investments that can be uh, important. And also your cost position uh, in terms of delivering care and keeping care local, that can actually be quite important. We have a number of clients that have looked at system partners and the system partner has had uh, a very clogged up uh, academic uh, medical center and really wants to keep pneumonia patients um, pre-COVID um, out at um, the, the rural or community affiliate um, where they can be treated effectively um, in general by the, the medical community and resources there. So enhancing your value, um, making sure that um, you, you've got adequate cash flow and you're working to enhance that cash flow, being able to quantify that and explain what you're doing. Um, executing on high priority initiatives to improve operating results. There's an additional link here to some resources um, that, that may be helpful for you as you think about contracts. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. We've got a poll up. How did I do that? I must have blown right through it. Huh. Okay. So let's go to um, the polling question. Um, do you have a plan? that places your organization on a sustainable path post-surge? Um, no, uh, we don't have a plan and we don't really know what a sustainable path looks like going forward. Partially, uh, we have a plan, uh, but it does not close the gap uh, in performance, at least totally to be sustainable. So we're making progress, but we, we don't really have a, a, a way to, or quantified way to completely close the gap. Uh, possibly, we have a plan, but it's really a question of whether we can execute. So we've we've articulated that path that'll fully close the gap, but it's uncertain on whether we can uh, execute. And then lastly, yes, we've quantified the performance gap, 
and we've got sufficient traction and we're highly confident that we'll be able to execute that plan. So um, we've got 25% uh, partially, 25% possibly, and 50% in the yes category, which is terrific. Um, that's, that's terrific. Um, let me quickly go back. I don't know if, I think my slides got out of order here. What I just wanted to reference to each of you uh, is as you work on those plans, you develop those plans, there's a set of resources that we've developed as a firm from our various contact content experts that um, I think may be very helpful. And so um, there's a link to those, and then there's also a link to a set of resources that we've been updating regularly. The last one was a, a week ago um, to look at the CARES Act and various other provisions of hospital uh, support and relief that's been coming down the pike. So um, very uh, uh, helpful and hopefully useful to you. Um, in terms of uh, pitfalls and where we are, um, one of the things we most frequently see, um, and it's it's avoidable, is that folks have waited too long to begin to work on the issue. Either they've they've been waiting for something else to occur to uh, mitigate uh, the impact, uh, or they haven't actually identified and quantified the gap necessary that they need to address. Um, in terms of partnering, there's no substitute for results. A plan that's quantifiable um, and uh, actionable and that you're implementing is a very different conversation with prospective partners versus, yeah, we know we've got issues um, and that's why we're talking to you, but we haven't really articulated the plan. That sends a very different message to prospective partners. Um, and I think we talk about differentiating yourself in a, in a competitive field to get attention and get resources, that's a key way to differentiate yourself. Uh, and the question of delay, um, there is uncertainty, um, but there is work that we know should be done even with that uncertainty. And the most uh, uh, upsetting comment we hear, and unfortunately it's it's not a one-off, it's something we hear frequently, is the regret that we should have done this a year, a year ago, or we should have had this conversation two years ago. It takes time to change the trajectory of an organization and you need to build that time into your own timeline. Um, and if you wait until the last minute, it's 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 real oftentimes too late uh, other than um, trying to do a distressed sale, which is you have no leverage or file for bankruptcy, but even those require time. And that's the misnomer. It's not like uh, if you've got, um, uh, you're worried about meeting your next payroll. There's no magic wand that will that will fix that. So it's it's really important to be proactive. Uh, and then lastly, and we've talked about this a little bit, not all partners are going to understand or want to understand your value proposition. And that's why it's important to hopefully talk to multiple prospective partners to understand who gets it. Um, and it's important to evaluate those options side by side. In the case of the case study I shared with you, again, they had a preferred option. Uh, they actually had had a, um, a letter of intent, non-binding of letter of intent entered into with, with the, the one partner and it had never gone anywhere. And the reason it hadn't gone anywhere is that partner just, I think, was really uh, equivative uh, or, or, or um, unclear, unsure about the value proposition of this affiliate. They were able to go out and find another prospective partner that um, really, really did see the intrinsic value. One of the things we would urge um, any organization to do as you th we're in this pandemic period of time is to look beyond just the standard set of opportunities. Um, don't just assume that we're gonna get back to status quo um, or return to normal. It might be a new normal. It might be something actually at variance from that for a couple of reasons. Uh, there's obviously the impact of the pandemic going forward. There's the impact of the recession that's been triggered by the pandemic. We don't know the length and severity of that. We do know that a recession and the impacts it has on employment and insurance coverage does have impacts on organizations in terms of their payer mix, in terms of their volumes, and obviously in terms of top line revenue. Um, one of the outcomes of the disruption from the pandemic might enable you to have a conversation with a different prospective partner or a different conversation with the same potential partner. And I'm thinking about um, uh, markets that are served by two or three healthcare systems. 
there may be a crosstown rival that you know, going back decades, there have been various attempts to come up with a, an approach that would create one seamless, integrated, uh, coherent delivery system to enhance services, reduce duplication, do all the things that most communities would want to have happen. Uh, and those conversations have not gone anywhere. A crisis and uh, pain um, that we're experiencing now as a set of providers and provider organization organizations creates an opportunity to have a different type of conversation with the same partner. Uh, in addition to having uh, uh, conversations with different partners. So it's important to think creatively about, about that and, and do it in a, a thoughtful um, and careful way. Um, if you are having a conversation or contemplating a conversation with a crosstown rival, it's really critical that um, you be very, very careful. And by careful, I mean uh, not do or say anything that could be interpreted by regulators as anti-competitive or contrary to community benefit. So there's very valid reasons to have a conversation with a crosstown rival and very valid community benefit that can be realized from that. But it needs to be, those conversations need to be carefully crafted and carefully thought out. Uh, again, focusing on community benefit and enhancing services reducing duplication uh, and cost, that's an appropriate motivation. Um, you can imagine the ones that are not appropriate. Um, and so you would wanna proceed as if the FTC is in the room with you. And I would recommend that um, you have some conversations with an advisor and counsel before you, you go down that road. New opportunities. Um, can result from from this disruption and pain if created if combined with creativity. Um, so the idea of non-traditional partners in some uh, smaller markets, rural markets, um, FQHCs, um, and there's limits and complexities around how you can align with an FQHC. But the idea again of avoiding duplication, creating an integrated model, and frankly taking uh, advantage of various designation and payment opportunities. Um, can be compelling if, if done in the right way. Um, so physician groups, county and district owned hospitals, all have their own unique uh, value propositions and thinking about how you can reduce costs, avoid duplication, create a sustainable path forward might result in some, some compelling and creative combinations. Um, Many organizations have a portfolio of assets and operations. Some of those assets and operations may be non-core and may not really contribute much to the organization's mission uh, or may be um, um, secondary to it. Looking at, um, should we be in that business? Is there a way for us to partner and joint venture that business? Or can we sell that off? Revisiting those, those questions uh, is important and can help streamline the organization, create it, make it more sustainable going forward. Um, and I think lastly, it's really important to think about how the pandemic has really focused us on how healthcare, uh, we, we've talked about changing healthcare uh, for years and years. The pandemic has really put a, a spotlight on a number of elements to this. So thinking about services outside the four walls of the hospital and to what degree do you now offer those in a, in a way that you didn't before and how does that impact your uh, your value to a partner. Uh, telehealth being a great example. Another one being if, if as part of your existing system or part of your organization, you have swing beds, um, utilizing those in a different way and to, to sustain healthcare and provide healthcare can be really um, uh, important and value creating. So some key takeaways. Um, it's really important in a time of disruption and uncertainty that as an organization, you have a defined path to sustainability that you're executing on. A, it provides direction internally uh, and really helps make better short and medium term decisions. But also if you believe you need to partner, having done that exercise and shown here's our path forward, that will be a very different conversation with prospective partners all other things being equal. Um, that's really critical. Delaying um, taking a look at, at some of these issues and making some of those hard choices, the, the consequence of that can be severe. And the analogy I would use is if you are starting off on a voyage and if, if the captain of the ship makes a two degree change, 
you you end up 150 miles from your original designation. If you're halfway across uh, to your destination, the degree of change that you need to to get to that same alternate destination is that much greater, double. And as you get closer to the destination, the, the, the course deviation required to achieve the same outcome becomes more and more severe. So the cost of delay here is really important in being on top of it. Um, executing the plan, um, will expand your options and help change the conversations you might have with prospective partners. And in terms of also uh, changing the risk profile of a standalone strategy, if you're able to, to address that gap in sustainability uh, and do it plausibly and in a reasonable timeline, it may um, allow you to continue to execute as a standalone hospital if that's if that's what your board desires. If you fail to do that, it removes that option in a very material way. Know your value, be able to communicate it to prospective partners. If you're having a conversation with a prospective partner, either you or your advisor had better be able to communicate and quantify uh, in a credible way your value to that partner. That's incredibly important. Not all partners will understand or want to understand your value. That gets back to strategic alignment between your organization and a prospective partner. And as always, our advice is, and this sounds obvious when we put it this way, but getting the wrong partner or the wrong structure or terms that are unenforceable or not aligned with your strategic objectives is a very costly uh, mistake, and we spent time helping folks unwind affiliations that uh, uh, weren't what their organization needed or community needed, and the results have been devastating, costly, years of distraction, um, and it's it's something that should be avoided at all costs. Um, a couple of points I'd make before we we wrap up. Um, there's a number of resources. I think if you click on any of these images, it'll it'll have a, a link that'll take you to our website. So some articles that talk about strategic uh, strategic options and partnering and thinking about how to partner successfully that could be uh, of help. Um, I'm certainly available. I think we've got a few minutes left to do some questions. Um, if folks have questions, there's my contact information. And then last, lastly, there's a little bit of um, description of uh, what we do at Stratwater. So should those resources I referred you to earlier uh, be of interest, please feel free to reach out. I think there's actually a, a click you can do on our website to set up uh, office hours to talk to a relevant content expert around any of these areas um, that might be of interest. So well, thank you, Benson. And thank you, Jeff. That uh, certainly covers a lot of material. And if you have questions now, feel free to use the questions section of the go to meeting window if you want to send one in or and these slides and a recording of this session will also be made available to everyone who has registered but we do have one question now that's come in already and it's concerning what has stroudwater's experience been during the pandemic with delayed or even canceled affiliations um thanks benson um happy to say um, we, we continue to advise a number of our clients that are various stages of affiliations, and none of them have been delayed or disrupted or canceled at this point. They're all progressing well, um, but that is a risk. Um, and we know of nationally other systems that are getting deals done, but we also know of systems that have, have basically pumped the brakes and said we're delaying until later in the year before we can proceed with an affiliation that was pretty far along. So it's a mixed bag, but I'm happy to report our clients and their prospective partners are proceeding uh, and, and making good progress. All right. And also had someone said, our hospital is going through an affiliation that has been delayed, and I worry about our, the value being eroded in the meantime. Any comments or suggestions? That's a great question. Um, I think it's really important that um, you have that game plan, um, which is you understand what your run rate is for the next 26 weeks, and you have some dialogue with your prospective partner as to what their needs are and expectations are. Uh, presumably, um, they're not going to upset 
what has been a, 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 a affiliation and works for a while um, over some minor issue. But on the other hand, these types of things can and do happen where folks look to revise um, the terms based upon operating performance. Um, so the critical thing is while you're working um, towards completing the affiliation is not take your eye off the ball and continue to focus on operations uh, and have the necessary dialogue you need to have with your prospective partner. Thank you. And also, had someone had a question about if you had any thoughts on how to best approach a crosstown competitor to discuss creating a more sustainable health delivery system in our market? Um, well, I think the word I used before was carefully, and I think that's that's very true. Um, the the legal uh, and regulatory uh, issues would be front and center there, so I certainly would would advise folks to do that carefully. The other opportunity with a, a crosstown conversation is to really think critically about what the needs and objectives of the other organization might be. Um, put yourself in their shoes, think about what a win-win looks like. Um, try to put the conversation on a plane where it's not about winners and losers, but it is about community benefit and creating a sustainable, aligned, integrated delivery system. Um, and I do think it's important is if you were to contemplate that, that um, you think that the look at the pandemic as really an opportunity to have a conversation that you might not have been able to successfully have previously, that this level of disruption and pain creates some potential openings. All right, thank you. And uh, looks like one final one here and a few minutes left that we had a failed affiliation process previously and given the pandemic challenges, is it worth trying again now? Um, the answer is it depends. Um, I, I think the, the key questions I would want to know in every circumstance is, is different. And a failed process is expensive and distracting and, and um, really disillusioning. Um, but what I would want to understand is, A, how recent was that? Um, understand the process. Did you talk to all the folks you should have been talking to? Um, was your value proposition effectively conveyed? Um, unfortunately, not every advisor appreciates, especially smaller or more rural uh, organizations, what they can bring to a system. Uh, and so having that conversation and being able to really document, quantify, and and educate is, is important. Um, did you have, at the time, a credible plan to address any operational um, issues, disruptions would be uh, an important consideration. Um, and we would want to understand the specific circumstances better, but um, we've worked with a fair number of clients that previously had had adverse outcomes or failed process and um, have had a good track record of getting them, um, you know, a, a good outcome with a, with a partner. Um, so it does depend, but, uh, you know, we'd want to know more before we could kind of uh, help you with that question. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I thank everyone who has joined. And uh, I guess take care of yourself. Thanks, Benson. Stay well, everyone.